up the context for the next conversation that we're going to be having. Philanthropy supports community-based and community-rooted organizations working across the food system. That support ranges from charitable support of food banks to justice-framed community-led and community-accountable initiatives and everything in between. In our next session, we will push and pull on ideas to reimagine philanthropic engagement with communities in ways that shift and share power and build collective community wealth through locally responsible food systems. Our moderator for this discussion is the amazing Jen Zuckerman. Our panelists include Stacey Barbas, Senior Program Officer for the Health of the Kresge Foundation, Virginia Clark, Executive Director of the Sustainable Agriculture and Food Systems Funders Organization, Jessalyn Keza, Community Engagement Program Officer at the University of North Carolina American Indian Center, and Olivia Watkins, co-founder and president of the Black Farmers Fund. Thank you so much, Monica, and thank you again, Dr. McCoy. And I think something from Dr. McCoy's slides are particularly relevant as we step into this philanthropy panel, because his slides clearly demonstrated where wealth is. And philanthropy represents white wealth, Philanthropy represents white power. And philanthropy represents wealth that was created off of stolen labor from enslaved Africans, off of stolen land from Jessalyn's people, from Vivette's people, from Mary's people. So I want to acknowledge what specifically it is that we're talking about. And I also want to acknowledge. As we're thinking about shifting and sharing power, that you can't ask those without power and wealth to shift and share power and wealth. So we're talking about how are we shifting. And so I get to be up here with friends and family, which I'm so excited about today. And as we're getting started on the panel, I'd love for you to just frame, you know, how you come to this work as you introduce yourself. So we'll go down the line. Jesslyn, if you don't mind starting. Very honored and humbled to be here with all of y'all. My name is Jesslyn Kazaya. I am an enrolled citizen of the Lumbee tribe of North Carolina. I came to this work very unintentionally. I am a child of rural North Carolina. Um, first generation college student, that, which is what brought me up to the Triangle, which is where I've now spent my career. Being involved in food systems work is in my blood. Everyone in my family has been in a relationship with the land, grown our food. I very much grew up in that environment, thankful for that grounding. It's a very different world up here where I now live. In my professional work, these days, I'm working at the American Indian Center, which is out of UNC Chapel Hill, and I have the very fortunate honor to be able to work in service to all of our tribal nations statewide. I have to also say I'm always humbled to speak before my elders, and it is upon my elders' shoulders, prayers, hopes, dreams, wishes, that I stand. And it's very clear to me that who I am accountable to is my community, beyond any of these structures and systems that have been created around us and without us. But where I do find myself in daily, in these spaces that were not created with us in mind. So it is with their power that I try to lift my voice and whatever leverage that I have. And working in Funding is not a world that I ever anticipated. I think navigating the world of grant makers, and I've often worked in intermediary spaces of organizations that are re-granting from larger funders, and I find myself these days in lots of conversations with larger funders, explaining dynamics that are happening really on the ground in community, which is where I've always tried to keep my feet. So that's the perspective that I come to you today. And I'm honored to be up here with folks, some who I've known for a long time, and some who are new to me. I think the conversation's really changing, as it should. I think it's about, you know, hundreds of years too late. 
but I'm thankful and honored to be in this generation, in this time and space where we're able to lift our voices, we're able to push forward, we're able to see these dynamics changing. So, thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm, I, too, I'm so glad to be here with all of you. This has been such an amazing day. It's been a little bit of pressure after all the speakers and have us coming at the end of the day, but I, I'm so honored and also humbled. So don't dislike me because I work for a national foundation. I, I landed there, and I hope to use this place of privilege to do good. And I am at the at Kresge Foundation. So a couple things I just wanted to mention also is I have a tendency to be better behind the scenes than I am in front. So if you hear something today that sparks your interest or that you want to know more about that I don't go into detail, please feel free to get in touch because I'm, I'm happy to do that because that's what this is about, right? It's about relationships. So I will say that I, I work for the Kresge Foundation, national private foundation located sits physically in the city of Detroit and also in the suburb of Troy, Michigan. Kresge is a community development foundation, if you will, and we are grant making. We do both grant making and investments through arts and culture, health, human services, education, and through our priority cities of Detroit, Fresno, um, New Orleans, and Memphis. I will say that I'm, I sit on the program side, so I sit on Kresge's health team. I've been with the foundation 15 years, so needless to say, I've seen a lot of changes within the foundation. Some good, some progressive, some less progressive, but that's a whole other story. So our health team really focuses on addressing and advancing racial, addressing racial equity and really addressing also health equity. And we do that by supporting community leaders to help work in the areas of social determinants of health, housing, food systems, et cetera. So Kresge has been a supporter. I am so thrilled that Kresge has been a supporter of the EFOD work for a number of years now. Happy to go into any detail. We started with a planning grant. We were familiar with the partners. We had worked with folks around the country. We knew the work was happening. And I'm so glad that a couple, a few years ago, we were able to begin to support the work of the planning grant. And now we are um, supporting it in a much bigger way. And I will just say that for our health team, um, we saw work that was happening, food system work that was happening around the country. It was not successful, as we saw, unless it was led by led and driven by communities. And so we also saw the, the incredible things that were happening in neighborhoods because of programs that were working in community. And so we um, are really proud to, to support this work. Um, and we, we do know that you know food systems, economic development, uh, et cetera, um, are such a critical way to help stabilize neighborhoods and help, and help neighborhoods from, from community within. But we'll also say that we saw how important it was that food systems bring uh, a sense of place and also a sense of community pride um, when they're connected to the food and culture of that community. Hello, everyone. I'm Virginia Clark. I serve in the professional capacity. I'm the executive director of the Sustainable Agriculture and Food Systems Funders. And after 19 years, I still stumble on the name and I stumble on the acronym. So if you do too, don't worry about it. I'm very honored to be here and it was fun this morning. I realized that the first time I actually heard equitable food oriented development as a term was in Greensboro, North Carolina at one of our meetings that we held in 2009. And it took me a while to get my head wrapped around it. And it's been really quite awe-inspiring, and someone at the end um, asked Dr. McCoy if he was hopeful. And I guess coming from that perspective over the last 12 or 13 years to imagine that this event is happening, that this number of community members are here from Durham, but that this work is going on nationally is pretty, in, is, is incredible. I sit on the shoulders, a couple of people came to mind um, today for me. One is my mother, whose name was Peaches. And she was one, I'm one of eight kids, and she always made room for one more. So it didn't matter who was showing up at our dinner table, 
there was always room for, more, for one more. So I have tried to kind of take that only, not only into my personal life, and people are always showing up at my house, but certainly in the professional life, and with this organization to increase the, pe increase the space for who and how people show up at the table. And the other is my mother's oldest sister, who, through her generosity and philanthropy, allowed me to finish going to university. And without that, I would never have done it. I would have given up. I was on the nine-year for college plan. And she said, I really want you to finish. So let me make that possible for you. It was, and she said, you can, you know, you can share that information. You don't have to share that information. It's also about a lot of secrecy that happens oftentimes in white cultures, uh, particularly around money. Um, but I have taken that forward and paid it back. So I have helped other people in my family and elsewhere to do that. And it's a small way to pay it forward. And the food systems work, I'm really excited because I get to touch, A, I get to sit up here with three of our board members. The fourth is sitting in the, in the front table. Um, there's a lot of power and privilege. And I was stunned and struck by the data, data that Dr. McCoy shared. Um, and I'm looking for ways to share that much more broadly. Hello, this is so weird. This is my first uh, panel in person with not Zoom boxes in two years, so I'm still like getting used to just being in a room with people. So thank you so much for being here, especially in the middle of a pandemic and you know, sitting and, and listening to all of us for you know, the entire day. It really means a lot to me. Being here for my first in-person panel, particularly in North Carolina, is also special for me. A part of my story is that my family stewards land in North Carolina. We steward uh, land that is on Tuscarora land, and we've been stewarding it since the 1890s. And so for me, being here, talking about the work that I do, talking about shifting power, it's been a really important part of my family's lineage for a long time to um, steward land that was in alignment with the ways that the Tuscarora people uh, used the land, which was for hunting and wildlife. And so we really focus on conservation of that land that we steward, especially as it's experiencing deforestation and fragmentation around it with a lot of the development. So that's how I came to, the, the, to this work through you know, this matriarchal lineage in my family of stewarding land. And I also did a lot of different farming work across the country. And I'm sitting here in front of you today representing my organization, Black Farmer Fund, that I co-created with some amazing people that focuses on nurturing and community building for black agricultural businesses in the Northeast. And so we do that in a couple of different ways. We use a type of impact investing model. And then we also are involved in advocacy work at the state level right now in New York. And we also do a lot of technical assistance and relationship building. And all of those different pieces are held within a framework and a values framework of having a community-centric, community-led organization, which is incredibly important as we get further into the, this, the discussion around how we're shifting power from philanthropic organizations into communities. So thanks again for having me. Thanks for teeing us perfectly up, Olivia, for just digging into the conversation today, because what we really want to start addressing and naming to at the beginning is power. And there is, no matter what organization it is, an inherent power dynamic between philanthropy and community. And I'm curious how each of you have either worked within it or how your work seeks to address that dynamic. And Olivia, if you don't mind starting us off. Yeah, so... Our organization is an organization that receives money from philanthropic organizations, from impact investors and individual contributors, and we distribute it out into our community. 
what was really important for us in the process of creating this organization was making sure that it was black led, that we had farmers or farm adjacent, farm lover appreciators on our staff, that we're building out an organization, that we have a board that has black farmers, black agricultural businesses. You know, and so while we did a lot of really hard work to ensure the diversity, you know, of of our organization, we're still a capital allocator and we still hold a lot of power in our community. And people see us as a source for financing, which was our goal. We were created because our community in the Northeast, they wanted a, a financial institution that they could trust. And so we're a financial institution, right? We have a financial vehicle. But still, that doesn't mean like, oh, okay, just because you, you, know, you have a fully black staff and a board, you know, we, we trust you automatically. There's still a power dynamic that exists. And one of the, the main ways that we you know, have looked to shift that is by bringing in the, the community that we have planned on investing in into the decision-making processes of how that money is being distributed. And so last year, we did a pilot fund round, right? Because we're all farmers and we're all grassroots organizers. We had no idea how to run a fund. And we were starting everything from scratch. And we knew that we really wanted to build in a a community-led piece. So while we had a fiscal agency run the actual portfolio management of our fund, we really dove deep into figuring out what are the nuts and bolts of actually having like decision-making power be led by communities. And so one of the like key examples is that typically, you know, in investment committees on in organizations are all staffed by people who have experience in finance, who are not in the communities that are that, that money is being distributed into, and that was not something that we wanted to do. So we created what we call a pilot community with t- uh, twelve black organizers, food businesses, and entrepreneurs uh, that made the decisions, and we even codified that by drafting a resolution that the board of the organization and the staff of the organization couldn't veto any of their decisions at any time. And so that was a really you know, powerful um, way for us to essentially lock in an accountability agreement to one another. Um, it was our responsibility to be able to educate the pilot community on whatever investment education and financial education that they didn't have. Um, and it was the accountability of our investment uh, committee to, you know, do, do right by Black Farmer Fund and um, create, uh, you know, great decisions on behalf of our organization. And so we completely relinquished that power to our pilot community. Um, and so I would say that's, that's one of the major ways. Yeah, thank you so much, Olivia. And I just like wanted to point out one aspect of um, the building things that haven't existed um, and what that means in terms of the time that it takes, the space that it takes to create things that haven't existed before, and just the, the trust and relationship that's critical in building something that might work, it might not, but it will be iterated on. So thank you so much for for pointing that out. Um, Would love to to hear from other folks on the panel, whoever else would like to jump in about uh, kind of addressing that power dynamic. Yeah, I can jump in and say something. Um, The power dynamic is so inherent and it's so physically felt Um, I think it's a very embodied experience, often for community, um, when funders are coming in, or for site visits, or just understanding um, the deep history that's going on. And so I want to talk about power in a couple of different ways. I think if you can't name that power dynamic, then you can't be an authentic relationship. And I think that's a place where we really need to stop ourselves and talk about very specifically where this money is coming from, who has decision-making power, who is sitting at the table, who is representing different organizations, who speaks first, where the most listening is happening in meetings, 
and at all points calling attention to that power dynamic that's there and at all points trying to find balance when we're talking about equity, right? How are we shifting that? We can't shift the balance of power if we don't recognize it and if we don't name it and call it out very explicitly. I'm also thinking about, and we're going through a situation um, at UNC right now with uh, eroding support for native um, studies, faculty, staff uh, on campus. And I, was, I had to step out for a, for a Zoom about that over lunch Kate, that I missed a little discussion with all of y'all would love to follow up with you. Um, but I was thinking about the power. Power was a word I found myself coming back to in that um, because I think there's the institutional power, right, of money, of privilege, of education, right, what is valued, and we're going to come back to talk about values, whose values are valued. But there's that institutional power, and then there's, to me, real power. Real power comes from community, real power from comes from being together. Real power comes from finding each other authentically. When I think about power, I think about Miss Vivette and how this woman, as you all experienced, radiates <laughs> the embodied truth of power. Something that's so profound to me. Um, I was moved to tears just your being up here on the stage. I always am in your presence. That, that to me is true power. And what are we recognizing as power? When, do, when, we, when we see that power, we feel it, we know it. And how much more real is that than anything that we put stock in as power? These, these false illusions of money. What is money, y'all? Money runs this whole world. What is it? It's an idea that we came up with, right? We are humans together in a collective human experience. That is what's real. That's where our real power lies, right? But we have to call out these falsehoods of power and able to be able to work with that, those dynamics, right? Um, I'm thinking about the leaders in my community who truly embody that sense of power and that what it comes from is it comes from listening. It comes from turning to the most affected people first, hearing, making space for. But then, and I'm a person who works at a PWI, right, at UNC, which was the first public university on this land and how deep it is to me the power that they've institutionalized and embodied without making space for the true power that exists here on the ground in this land and our people, right? I'm gonna come back to values in a minute, but I know other folks have thoughts. Well, um, I'd I, I appreciate you naming all of that because I think, you know, again, speaking to that institutional power um, and I need to lift you up here, Stacy, because Cameron and Aaliyah and I got to experience you wielding your power in a way that was in support of community organizations. And <laughs> the badassery of the women continues uh, and will be one of the themes that we lift up from the, con uh, from the conference, definitely. And um, I would just love for you to speak about, because there's a lot to navigate within your organization and in your role, um, but just your ethos of that, Stacey, would be great to hear. Thank you. Um, the biggest compliment you could give me is that I'm a badass. <laughs> I'm, I'm grateful. Um, and Jocelyn, as you were talking, I was, I was thinking about, and I, uh, uh, forgive me because I'm going to repeat a couple things you said, is um, so the way, so I'm, I'm very lucky because uh, so our foundation began to think about equity and what that meant, and we've been looking at what that means um, internally and um, externally, how we do our grant making, what we look like internally. So there's been a big... Um, a lot of work on that for a few years, um, and we have some incredible people leading that work. Um, and I will say that, um, and as a health team, we're interrogating every last one of our strategies, and I won't go into those in detail, but we're looking at that. And what we know at, for our team, one of the principles that we live on, it's not about 
um, it's not about the grants, but it's about how, how you work with folks and how you do the work, because it's not really just about the grant. So that's really important. And we, we're committed to, as my, one of my favorite colleagues will say, we're committed to learning and unlearning. Right? So we continue to learn. And what we adapted as a team a number of years ago was one is that we do truly believe that communities are, but people are experts in their own communities and we want to listen and learn from those communities to see how we can support those communities because we think that's really important. We also think it's hugely important to take, to make sure that organizations and folks that we support take into context the historical trauma that's happened in that community. Because people will say, oh yeah, we know about history, but no, we want to really look at what that means and we think that's really important. Um, and we know that once a, uh, a solution comes from a community, it's much more sustainable, right? It lives on because that's what's supposed to happen. So we're really, um, we're, we really try, try to do that. Um, the example that Jen's referring to is, you know, we had a situation, um, and I won't go into details, um, in, in the foundation, and I knew uh, we had two key partners in the foundation that could help bridge that work. Uh, Chantel Rush, who is our managing director of um, our American Cities practice, and my colleague Sidra from that team is here today, and I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that she's here with us, and also Anna Cruz, who is our uh, managing director of uh, strategic learning and evaluation. And I lift them up because they are two um, women earlier in their career than I am, two women of color who are managing directors in a foundation. That's a big deal. And they are phenomenal women. And so being able to, to, do, to listen and hear and see the gifts that other folks have and be able to share that, I think is really important. I mean, there's so many more things that, that I could mention, but I just want to say, I think the listening and hearing is critical. And I wrote something down that you said that I think is so important is who speaks first, mm -hmm. right? So when we go into, when we go for well, site visits or whatever we call them, we don't walk in and say, hi, we're here. We work with the partners and say, we're thinking about coming. We really would love to see your community. Are you interested in having us come, you know? So first of all, you know, second of all, is one or two people okay? Do you feel better? Are you okay with that? Do we need are four or five people too much? You know, and will you help us design? What, how would you like to see that happen? Um, and so it, I think those are really important in, in, in leveling. Um, the field, but I think that I really like that idea of who speaks first. I, I think that's it's a really important point. So thanks for bringing it up. Well, Stacy, I think one of the things that you brought up that um, doesn't happen often in philanthropy is is the asking. Um, and then the second piece, which is the actually listening and doing. So asking and then not questioning the answer um, is really key to that bringing down of the power differential. So if you ask, that's what it is. Um, and we've got a lot of different buckets to move into. So um, I did want to, um, we will circle back to power, but I'd also like to talk a little bit more since the conference is about rooted in relationship. I'd really like to talk a, a little bit more about relationship um, and the learning curve that has to happen to authentically engage in relationship. So um, Virginia, I'd like to start with you and just, uh, you know, because you oversee a network of foundations. So what patterns are you seeing and what behaviors do you see across philanthropy that need to shift? Well, we don't have all day. <laughs> <laughs> um, but one of the things that has really struck me um, since I've been doing this work is the power, and this goes to the power dynamics and the relationships that are shifting amongst those who are in philanthropy. So it's a very different um, experience for those coming from Kresge or coming from a, an individual donor who has only a million dollars or a corporate foundation. So there is a hierarchy within philanthropy and within investors. You know, Jeff Bezos is valued more than the one black billionaire that is up on that list. There is an inequity in terms of who speaks first. Oftentimes, you know, Jenny was talking about um, asking 
doing or listening. Oftentimes the bigger foundations will come in and do, and then maybe they'll ask, and maybe after someone calls them out on it, they'll listen. That's shifting. And part of it is shifting because people in community are saying, we're not gonna listen to you anymore. We have something to say, we have something to show you. Your work is only gonna be so successful or it won't be successful if we're not successful. And your dollars will be spent unwisely and they will go you know, not to good use. So that's one of the things that is, is shifting is that people are starting to A, um, listen between the types of foundation. I actually had a large foundation said, well, we don't really need to belong to your network because it's mostly just those family foundations and I can't really learn anything from them. What was striking is that the family foundations are much more connected to community. They're much more likely to get the money out more long term and get money out um, you know, with far less strings attached. Uh, there is a, a trend, um, whether or not it just is kind of the flavor of the week in philanthropy this, um, this year is trust-based philanthropy. And people are really trying to wrestle with what does that mean? How do I trust that if I give you a million dollars, you'll do the right thing? But the, the questioning is, what's the right thing? Is it my right thing or is it your right thing? and they're actually starting to ask those questions. So I'm both really hopeful, really impatient. Um, I sit in kind of a weird gray zone because we are both grantee and I'm seen by many of the uh, partners or the, the NGOs on the ground, I'm seen in the kind of funder category. We don't give out money, we have to, you know, we're in the grant writing business as well. Um, but it's a weird space, but I also see that I have the privilege of having access to the funders, direct access to them, and I can, it's easier for me to call things out that I see or that other people want to relay to funders. Uh, so those of you who are getting money from funders in the food and ag space, if you have bad philanthropic or investment partners, I'd love to know about them because it's easier for me, um, I'm not as, Mm, wed to their money. Yeah. It's not my community who might be suffering if something doesn't change. So I would like that to offer that. Thank you, Virginia. And yeah, Virginia will straight up call funders out. Uh, so that is how it rolls out at our board meetings and that's how it needs to happen. So thank you. Um, I wanna to turn to Olivia too, because you spoke a lot about relationship uh, in your opening remarks and really how you're codifying relationship through the Black Farmer Fund. So can you speak about how the Black Farmer Fund and the work that you and your team are doing to just live into that relationship? Cause you're kind of also in that gray zone that Virginia's in of being both a funder and a grantee. Yeah, it's an interesting place to be and also to acknowledging the fact that we're operating not only within the nonprofit industrial complex, but also like the financial complex that exists within the, the uh, Securities Exchange Commission. I mean, we're definitely federally exempt from a lot of things because we are a 501c3, but you know, there's just a, a very standard way of doing investing that, um, is very black and white and is not considerate at, and, and, and it's based off of like market rate returns and extracting out of communities. There's been a body of work, you know, recently around impact investing. A lot of organizations like Boston Impact Initiative um, and Boston Ujima Project and others have been, um, you know, at the foreground in terms of being able to change some of these super um, extractive based loan agreements and security agreements and all those super boring documents that are 50, 60 pages, usually stacks of pages that, you know, now we're having to take that language and expecting, you know, agricultural businesses expecting a sole proprietor to fill out 60 pages for, you know, a loan. It's ridiculous. So um, we... Um, have learned a lot from uh, Boston Impact Initiative especially. They've worked with um, a couple of different law firms to reduce down some of these loan agreements from like 60 pages to like nine. 
um, which is still a lot, um, but it's definitely you know progress in figuring out okay, you know what are the actual what are the important clauses that need to be in here, not only to ensure that the organization can continue to serve the community, but so that way we can also protect the borrower. Um, because typically a lot of the loan agreements are just for the organization. There's no consideration at all for the borrower. And so there are things like um, this, hap this is a, a thing in mortgages, like you get uh, penalized if you pay early. So we've, we've taken out uh, clauses like that, any sort of penalizations. Even if people are late for uh, payments, you know, it's a, about a conversation first that can then either lead to refinancing, you know, or even like accessing emergency fund pools that we have rather than like, this is late, we're not gonna go into why and have a conversation about why, you know, we're just gonna make assumptions. So that's one thing that was really important to us. Um, and then another thing that was important to us was like, how can we create um, clauses to incentivize in the loan agreements um, a focus on the social goals that our borrowers have. Um, the, how we decided on our borrowers to begin with was because we were looking at what's their ecological impact, how are they building wealth in their community, and how are they prioritizing economic justice. And so, you know, it's easy that once, you know, we, we give folks money, they're just so focused on, um, you know, not only returning that principal and interest, but, you know, being able to prioritize profit. And so we want to make sure that there's not only language in the loan agreement to um, in, encourage and support that fi the, fi the community wealth building, but also encouraging and supporting, you know, some of the farmers' dreams that they have around hiring BIPOC folks as uh, market uh, truck drivers or um, distributing a percentage of their profits to their local church or, or a percentage of their yields to their local church, like all those things that are equally as important. So we use what's called impact covenants. And so these impact covenants, they basically codify some of the goals that um, our borrowers have. And at the end of the maturity date of the loan, if a borrower is able to uh, meet that either at the end or you know, between that time frame, then they'll get a reduction on their interest rate, which will either be if they meet it before the end, it'll be like um, the, the rate will reduce, or if they meet it right at the end, then we'll pay, we'll pay them back the, the interest as a result. So. Um, that's one of the ways that was really important, important to us. Um, and I would also say in terms of relationship, like just an another way that um, has really been important is around collective fundraising with other organizations. Um, you know, I think there's, there's a huge shift that's happening right, right now in philanthropy where a lot of funders are starting to see organizations and collectives coming together and um, you know, coming together on grant applications and asking for larger pools of money rather than you know, different organizations that might be doing the same work but are like vying for you know, smaller pieces of the pie. And so we do that particularly with a, um, a small collective called the Ecosystem, and it's an ecosystem of um, six uh, food-based service providers in the Northeast. So we serve as the uh, financing arm. Um, there's an organization called Soul Fire Farm and Farm School NYC that serves as the education training programs, and that's a really huge part of our pipeline. Um, uh, Corbin Hill Food Project does a lot of distribution um, for farmers into urban communities in New York. And then also Black Farmers United New York State does a lot of advocacy work at the state level. And Northeast Farmers of Color Land Trust um, uh, takes in land gifts, uh, does conservation easements, helps to get BIPOC folks access to land, um, and does rematriation. And so the fact that like all six of these organizations are coming together, building relationship, going to funders, asking you know for larger pools of capital, right? If there's a grant that you can ask, you know, only let's say two hundred thousand, we're going to ask for like a million, you know, <laughs> um, because you know there there are these. Uh, Organ it's just so important for organizations to be able to come together and work together and um, have practices right outside of the fundraising to be able to support our work and also to be in relationship with funders um, so that way funders are seeing like you don't have to put so much pressure on one organization to do all the things. 
um, you know, you can invest larger pools of capital into a network of organizations that are working together to be able to achieve some of the priorities that you're looking to achieve. Mm. Olivia, that you spoke so much uh, to values um, and what was how to build out relationships by putting values first. Uh, and so, Jesslyn, I just want to um, kind of turn the conversation a little bit um, and have a conversation about values. And really, in these funder relationships, whose values do we value? Um, and how have you seen that play out? I really appreciate you asking me that question. And I'm going to ask you to re-ask me that question in just a minute because there's something that is sitting on my heart so much right here that I, that I need to speak it first. Um, talking about relationship, talking about history. Um, and I think when we talk about relationship, we often approach it from this place of relationship building. How do we come in and start to begin relationships that allow for a more authentic connection? And I think what we're not recognizing in that conversation is that there is already relationship that exists, whether we recognize it or not just because all of our histories and all of our present moments are tied together in all of these myriad of ways, whether or not we're recognizing it, but all of that history is in the room with us at all times. And so what I'm thinking about particularly, and this is something, um, this may not land well in some areas um, with some people in this room, but this is something I've really started bringing up in conversations with funders because my people are sitting with this um, at all times, and I know we're not alone in that, in really having that um, history and presence, you know, right here at the forefront of any conversation, is those relationships that already exist are, how did this organization come to be that has all this money, that has all this power? There's a relationship of history that's already there that has been built over generations, over generations, over generations that has brought us to this moment. And if we're not recognizing that history and those relationships all along the way in the moment, then we can't start to build because what, what ground are we starting on? So I'm thinking about, um, you know, in our communities, indigenous people, we've been here watching the story of America play out since day one. We are people of oral history and tradition. We pass down stories. I'm thinking about um, meeting a Halawasaponi elder of mine in a parking lot to buy a piece of art. And um, he was like, Jessel, let me, let me tell you a story. <laughs> he started in 1703, and the story started in 1703, OK? And it went all the way up until 2020. This was in 20, spring of 2020, OK? But it, the, the story started in 1703 and played all the way up. Mm -hmm. So then I'm thinking about funders and when funders come into community. And these days, funders are using words. We believe in equity. We believe in relationship. We have these lens. We want to fund you know, black and brown communities, BIPOC communities. I'm also thinking about funders coming in and using words like BIPOC and my elders saying, excuse me, what do you mean? What, what's that word that you've just said, right? And, and where intentions fall short of lived realities right? Identity, self-identity. Um, but I'm thinking about in the history of just being in deep relationship and what's so deep about indigeneity is being in this deep relationship to the land and all of the history that's there, right? So that means that when these organizations come in with these big names that they hold as power and prestige and something that they're offering, we are offering you know, the services of, um, I'm just thinking of local foundations, um, the Reynoldses, the Dukes, the Keenans, right? Um, and we're like, oh yeah, we know the Keenans. We've been watching the Keenans for a couple hundred years, you know? Now the Keenans are showing up with words like equity. That's not how the Keenans have always been showing up, right? And so where people may sit and, and something that uh, you may notice when you're working in Native communities is oftentimes we'll sit very quietly and listen and let you show yourself without speaking a word and just let it keep coming out. Oftentimes that's received as um, deference or, or, oh, they're so honored that we're here. Um, 
And a lot of times we're just listening to the Keenans talk about equity and being these change makers of, of equity, right? When we're like, you know, we've been in this relationship with the people you come here claiming to represent for hundreds of years. And now the story's changing. I, hope, I mean, hopefully the story's changing. I'm all for the story changing, you know? But let's not deny everything that has led up until this day when you opened the doors, came in, and spoke first, right? Um, and so that's something that I've started naming in conversations with funders, right? That when you're meeting with people in communities that have been impacted by the ways that you have gained power, that all of those dynamics are there in the room. And we have to be in a place where we're addressing that before we can be in any kind of meaningful relationship of, okay, now we're here at this table together. How do we be in better relationship? How do we move forward, right? Because we're starting, here we are. So how do we move forward from there? Now ask me about values. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's a different question. <laughs> I think the question first is, whose values has philanthropy valued? <laughs> I'm teeing you up for a big one. So at the end of the day. Yes. Um, and I'd also like to then like move to uh, Stacy and Virginia and Olivia to think about how do we value things differently? And how do we move in humility to do that? I'm thinking back to how Miss Vivette opened the day with the call of the four auras. <laughs> right? And being in relationship, having responsibility, being in reciprocity, right? Being in this place where we're sharing. And I'm thinking about times when I've been uh, asked to represent an organization that's coming into community that's offering funding, again, intermediary organizations, and coming in with these kind of strict set of rules of how you act, what you're allowed to say, what you're allowed to put forward, and how deeply out of community values that is. Um, and for me, as a, as a rural girl who tries to keep my feet and my hands and my heart and my ears in community, um, how that was asked of me to separate myself from myself and how I cannot exist in that space. So I'm thinking about um, some of my earliest times going down to the Kohari tribe, who has been doing some of the most amazing, profound, inspirational work in the state that has led ripples across all sorts of communities. They have this phenomenal community garden, multiple acres. They feed their entire community. Um, and for them to be offering, you know, we want to send you home with food, right? Anyone that shows up is sent home with something. And how deep, that is such a deep indigenous value that, you know, and that was so, that was so ingrained into me. If someone shows up at your house, if someone shows up at your, at your place, you give them the best that you have. It doesn't matter if the best that you have is a peanut butter and jelly, you give that to them, right? You give whatever you have. And so for the community to say, we have these beautiful squash and beans from the garden and, and we want to gift that to you and there's, and there's, um, gifting ceremonies at every indigenous event you'll ever go to, you will see some sort of degree of gifting, right? But program officers are told, okay, we can't accept any gifts from any, right, because of the power dynamic, right? But even that that exists outside of the true value of relationship, right, which is, it's so disrespectful to turn that down, something that's given so authentically, right? And so whose values are put in that moment, in that relationship, whose values are guiding that, and how do we be in a space of being in authentic values and relationship? I'm also thinking about um, even through, so we do some regranting um, at the American Indian Center just on a small scale through our Healthy Native North Carolinians network. And we really focus on uh, tribal self-determination, right? Recognizing the sovereignty of tribal nations as self-governing structures that internally know communities, and this I'm talking about tribes, but we could be talking about other communities, right? Communities know what they need. They have existed in those relationships, knowing what they need, trying different models, knowing what works, knowing what doesn't work. Um, so often we go to funding red, you know, websites, it's like, here's the priorities that we fund. Here are the set models that we expect. Oh no, we are, we are doing prescription programs. We are doing produce prescriptions, you know? Okay, well maybe our community has something that, that, that 
works for us, it's not a produce prescription, right? But who is gonna get funded in that moment? Um, one thing that we really try to focus on is letting those priorities and the models be determined by community and not making assumptions on what that might be. Um, I'm thinking about the disdain for the metrics that I've been asked to write up in reports. Mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking about how when we're giving money to communities who know their own needs, the final reports, y'all. What is this whole thing about the final reports, right? People are not out here trying to exploit money that they get in their community. They're trying to do good work in their community. They know what's best, right? That we expect these very specific numbered quantifiable metrics when what might be most impactful is the cultural shift that happens, right? Is the spirit of community that brings, is the new day of hope that ha that's happening in ways that might be way beyond what we can quantify and put on a page. And so um, we've had to have real conversations with our funders about um, widening the degree of what is acceptable, what we encourage, um, and where we step back and say, it's not our place, to, it is not my place to determine what is most impactful for this community, right? Who knows themselves better than I could ever as an outsider, even as an insider outsider, right, from communities who, because we are not all the same, <laughs> that we have to respect where the knowledge truly is and then defer to that. Um, and so it is a value shift in this organization, but also for me it's just like how do we best align with the values of the community that we're claiming to serve, claiming to be in relationship? How do we stop claiming to be in relationship and actually be in true relationship, right? Which goes beyond these site visits, these expected metrics, these times of showing up, right? How do we be in such deep, deep relationship that we know the people's families, that we know your son's film project, right? <laughs> that we know uh, Miss Sis and how she loves when the elderberries come in and she wants to be the one to wash the elderberries and direct everyone around, right? And that that allows the work, people's like, oh, well, that's not the work, what the work is about, but that allows the work to broaden and deepen in a way that we could never get to by these ways of how we try to make it so linear. And I'll step back. So um, you've named so many aspects of values and so much of the values are from the philanthropy perspective coming in from the perspective of humility. And having had a, a background in a career in philanthropy before coming to the World Food Policy Center, um, I got to experience the the joy of relational connection. Um, I got to experience what, uh, you know, being a conduit to these funds can be. So I'd love to hear uh, Stacy and Virginia and Olivia as we start to close out the panel, kind of your thoughts on values and how philanthropy can value healing in community uh, and what that looks like for you. I think I'll, I'll start. Um, what struck me is that I think oftentimes funders um, want to fix something. So rather than they want to go in, they see a problem or the, somebody else has identified a problem. It's like, okay, I'm going to throw money at it and I'm going to fix it. And sometimes, um, and I know because I do this myself, I want to fix something for my kids. I want to fix something for our sister. I want to fix something for my neighbor. Um, and sometimes the fix is just showing up. Just being there to um, be present to what is, to understand what is, to understand what might be helpful. And sometimes funders don't think that the only way that they can contribute is by putting, kind of throwing dollars at it. Oftentimes the dollars are not the most important part. It's about introducing your grantee partner to another funder. It's about sharing your resources, whether that's kind of giving legal help or giving financial help or providing the kind of the financial backbone to another organization. It's about the funders who actually will convene their grantee partners 
not expecting that there are X, Y, and Z outcomes or that you're going to have to all you know, write a report and say what the metrics were. It's just getting you all in a room, getting us all in a room, because I know I have benefited by several of those um, being a grantee partner and showing up. There has been incredible work in the food system that has come out of those meetings just because people got to be in relationship. And that the dollars are sometimes, they're incredibly important, but that's not, is, it's not always the most critical. And sometimes it's the one thing that gets really in the way. Um, and I think that when, when you, when as funders, and I put myself in this category, even though we don't give out money, but I spend a lot of time with the foundation folks, um, is to really check the assumptions about what I bring about a certain organization or about a certain individual. Um, and I think that that's fairly human, but I know when there is power and money behind it, it's even greater that my assumption is more accurate than anybody else's. Um, so again, it's just about showing up and listening and recognizing and being able to sit in the really uncomfortable spot of being called out. And that if you are in relationship, um, I think all of us who have ever been in any kind of relationship, and I know that that's everyone because we all came from some family, but it's uncomfortable sometimes to be called out. And um, I think the breakthroughs are when you get through that. And when you recognize that uh, with a little bit of graciousness, a little bit of graciousness will go a long ways. Multi-year grants, minimum three years, um, with little to no reporting requirements. Patient capital, um, you know, not waiting until the fund is like 10% filled, 20% filled, like being the first mover on the mm. fund. Um, you know, not having a really long due diligence process um, where the fund is, you know, or the organization is expected to pr produce all these different documents. Really focusing on relationship building and having conversations around progress um, rather than expecting organizations to produce documents. Um, those are, you know, the main two ways that I feel like philanthropy can concretely move into healing. Um, another one, as Virginia said, making connections to other funders, um, especially if there are organizations that are working on systemic change. They're going to need funders for 5, 10, 15, 20 years. And so making sure that there's that continuation of money flowing into organizations so that way they spend less time applying for grants and more time facilitating and building relationships with funders who are really invested and interested and not having them do extra work. Um, you know, for us, these things have been really important to us as we have, you know, chosen the funders and investors who we're working with because we're choosing investors and funders who, um, you know, we're the, we're the recipient of their equitable practices and the way that they're practicing equity in their organizations so that way we can then turn around and be equitable to our community so that way we don't have to extract. Um, so. La like very, very no to less extractive terms, especially with um, impact investing funds um, as well is something that um, can be on the path to healing. Also just to add to that, I'm thinking about, you know, there's so much focus on um, project-based support or program-based support and we need general operating support, y'all. We need the, just the staff. We need the people, right? The programs cannot exist without the people. <laughs> We need to solidify and institutionalize, right, and strengthen just the internal capacity before we can start having these conversations about what programs, what projects, right, what you need to be doing next. Um, and I'm glad to see that conversation start happening right now in the funding world. I'm seeing more folks turn towards general operating support, towards these larger grants, towards funding, um, you know, partnerships of multiple organizations and being a little more flexible. Um, but it's, it's still so small, the percentage out there. And I think also what you spoke to of just the need to be the first one who's willing to make the fund, the funding, right? Um, it's so important because there's amazing work that's happening. And I know there, we had another thing in here about the, the misalignment of the values of, um, what is funded, what, what's given attention to, and what is felt as most impactful by community. And I think that's a space where we really need to sit and listen 
to folks about what are the values that are most held here, where are those needs that are not expressed on any kind of strategic plan on a website from a funder of what is the most prioritized, you know, directed streams of funding based on, you know, evidence-based research. Um, and then let's just stop and talk about evidence-based, right? Whose base of evidence? Who are the ones who are funded to do that research, right? And I'm thinking back to my time. I went back for my master's in social work at UNC, which was killing me at all times <laughs> with their focus <laughs> about um, that we have to be you know, using these evidence-based practice skills, right? But it's only coming from such a small sliver of people who have had historical access to the places where they're able to write the papers to the other people who have also had access, right? We're talking about rich white people <laughs> and almost no one else. And then I'm also thinking about in strategic plan for the school and their like community-based funding strategy. Um, you know, we, we, are, we wanna be working in community and we wanna be supporting community. And then that every one of the bullet points under community had nothing to do with community and had everything to do with funding the research of the people who were already doing the research, who were already in those halls of power, and then that's what you respect as evidence. And to me, none of that's acceptable, right? The evidence is in the hands of the people who are doing the work to serve their community who have been trying without the resources and know the complications, know that we were talking about systems thinking earlier, right, and how that exists in community more than it exists in any of these, because it has to, right, living in this holistic way. And so just thinking about whose, whose values do we value, whose evidence do we value, whose names are on the papers, um, all of that. I think we just have to really call into question everything that we see in print and where did it come from, whose language is this, who's comfortable using this language, how do people speak about themselves, is it the same or is it different? And almost all the time it's different. So then at that point, who do we start listening to? Jen, if I could just make one other comment. I was just thinking about, as, as, I, as I heard um, everyone talking, I think that I would say about what, what um, relationships. Funders are horrible about time, right? It takes philanthropy forever to figure out a grant-making strategy. And then when it happens, it's like now you all have to, people have to you know, apply next, you know, in a month, and then you have to turn this around. So, I think that encouraging uh, folks to the best that you can, and what we try to do internally is, you know, community change doesn't happen overnight. We certainly don't, you know, are not good at that. So being, I would say, don't be afraid to say those kinds of things to, your, to a program officer or anybody else. Also, don't be afraid to push or make an ask. I, I have been so lucky because uh, I've had the ability to work with Daisa quite a bit. Trisha and I work together all the time, and Trisha, in her very gentle way, well, with all due respect, Stacy, I don't think that's right. And I, we want you to consider doing X, Y, and Z. And honest to goodness, it's gone from a planning grant to a grant where we, we listened to the collaborative and we made the funds to now we're recommending $9 million in funding over the next three years so that the collaborative and the fund can do the work. And that's because I've been pushed and you have to be open and willing. So I just say, don't be, a, I know it's hard with funders. Ask me, call me up and ask me if I can give you some advice, but honestly, don't back down to what's right. Well, I think that's a great way to wrap, Stacy, because I think that, you know, for those of us who are here on the panel right now, um, we are in philanthropy. Um, and so it is incumbent upon us to work within philanthropy, to push within philanthropy, and to change philanthropy, but we cannot change philanthropy from the perspective of what those of us in philanthropy believe should be changed in philanthropy. So it is, you know, as Aaliyah said earlier today, everyone here is an expert in their own lives. So how we can be in service of supporting the changes that are needed in communities, led by community, and supported by philanthropy is where we hope we can work with everyone in this room to keep moving. So thank you so much.